Hi, Michelle Glass here. Welcome back to another episode in our digestive system conversation. This is still chapter four, lecture 24. And this episode is all about the large intestine, which is composed of a small area called the cecum. And then the majority of the large intestine can be referred to as the colon. So let's get started here with one of my drawings of the large intestine. So we see that the ileum is going to deposit uh, material from the small intestine into the large intestine. That material first enters this kind of holding enlarged area called the cecum. There is a valve separating the ileum and the cecum called the ileocecal valve. Remember the ileum is that last portion of the small intestine. Also in this area, but not drawn in the picture, is the appendix, which is actually an important lymphatic organ. It's a little extension here of the uh, large intestine that has a lot of lymphatic tissues. Okay, from the cecum, material will move into the ascending colon, the transverse colon, the descending colon, and then through a little twist that's somewhat S-shaped, and so it's called the sigmoid colon, where it's sigmoid means S-shaped. And then the final portion is the rectum, which then will lead to the anus. Now jobs of the large intestine include reabsorption of water, so we can also talk about it as compaction of the fecal material and you're compacting it by removing and reabsorbing a lot of that water. There is some digestion that's happening here, 10% of your total digestion, um, but that's only happening because in with the chyme that was secreted into the cecum, you have those enzymes from the small intestine, so they can continue working. And then you have this microbiome, which we're gonna talk about more here. It's basically what you can call also your gut flora. It's bacteria and fungus and viruses that are living in and a functional part of your large intestine that are doing the work of digestion. So the large intestine itself is not making or secreting any enzymes to assist with digestion. The microbiome is also responsible for producing some key vitamins that can then be absorbed here. So really you have just a small amount of nutrient and vitamin um, absorption happening at the large intestine. Um, a significant amount of water reabsorption happening at the small at the large intestine, excuse me, and then we are seeing some removal of organic waste products happening um, with this organ as well. Okay, so our microbiome um, are the organisms that are living in the large intestine, and a lot of times um, when we haven't studied. Uh, science and bacteria. We think of them as bad and disease causing organisms, but that is not true here. So it is an important part of your body to have this group of bacteria and viruses and fungi uh, taking up residence in your large intestine and they're actually helping you to get some key nutrients and vitamins from your food. So there are actually three vitamins that are being produced with the help of your microbiome. The first we can mention is vitamin K. Vitamin K is required by the liver to make clotting factors, including prothrombin, which is one we talked about specifically when we were looking at the, um, uh, what's it called? The classic pathway. Um, that's not the right word, but we have the intrinsic and the extrinsic, and then the common pathway is the name I was looking for. Biotin is another important vitamin that's being produced by your microbiome. Um, this is going to be required for several reactions that our cells do, including glucose metabolism. So it's going to be key. And then the third is a vitamin B3, which is required to make important steroids. Steroids include cholesterol and estrogen and androgens like testosterone and also some important neurotransmitters. So obviously the microbiome is important here in helping to produce some of these vitamins um, for our body. We also will see that the microbiome can help with that removal of organic waste. And we've actually talked about this a little bit. We mentioned Billy Rubin when we were talking about the uh, recycling and um, 
removal of old red blood cells. The bilirubin is going to be converted by microbiome into those urobilins and stercobilins, most of which are going to be removed by the body uh, with the fecal material. Also, the breakdown of peptides produces several waste products, including ammonia, indole, and scatol. Those are producing a lot of the odor that's associated with feces. Hydrogen sulfide gas um, is produced as a result of breaking down proteins. That's that rotten egg smell. Um, and then ammonia, as mentioned, is toxic to the body. Some of this is, you know, a lot of this is just going to be removed in the large intestine, but some can get reabsorbed back into the bloodstream where it's then removed by the liver. And then you also see indigestible polysaccharides that are providing nutrients for your microbiome, resulting in the production of flatus, um, which is gas. The last thing we need to talk about is what is called the defecation reflex. Now the defecation reflex involves a specialized type of peristalsis, which is referred to as mass movements. Um, the signature feature here is that we're still doing that kind of like uh, wave where you're squeezing in order to push material um, or propel material through the digestive tract, but in this case, it's a more of a powerful sort of hold and squeeze to really get that material moving out. Remember, we're talking about moving uh, a more compact material than what we were moving throughout the rest of the digestive tract, so it makes sense that you might need a little bit more power here. The mass movements are gonna help move material from that transverse colon into the descending colon. And then it's also helping to force material into the rectum. Once you have material in the rectum, you're going to be stimulating stretch receptor cells, which is what will actually trigger the defecation reflex. So defecation reflex is stimulated by material in the rectum, stretching the stretch receptor cells of the rectum um, causing a whole reflex mechanism. Now the defecation reflex has two key parts, so let's look at each one of those. Before we do that, let's look at some of the muscles that are involved here. The um, anus has two different types of sphincter muscles. You have an internal sphincter muscle. These are always contracting to keep the um, anus closed, but this is going to be unconsciously controlled um, group of muscles. And then you have the external anal sphincter, which is a skeletal muscle that you studied as part of your AMP1 lab work. This one is also contracting in order to keep the anus closed, but you have to consciously relax the external anal sphincter in order for defecation to occur. So this is where that control over defecation comes into play. Okay, so let's take a look at our reflex mechanism. So we're gonna have a, first a short reflex. Short reflexes mean localized. This means it's outside of the central nervous system. So this is also described as the intrinsic, again meaning internal, myenteric reflex. So it's involving that myenteric plexus. Your defecation reflex is a positive feedback mechanism. So remember that looks like you're going along at homeostasis, your signaling gets more and more and more extreme until you finally go back to homeostasis. So in this case, we have fecal material moving down into the rectum. Once we reach the rectum, remember, we're going to stimulate stretch receptors. So this is, of course, part of our afferent uh, nervous system, which means our sensory receptors. This stretch receptor um, neuron, or the stretch receptors are stimulated, the afferent neuron is stimulated. That then is going to stimulate an efferent motor neuron, which is gonna stimulate peristalsis. So you're gonna have peristalsis at the sigmoid colon and also at the rectum, really helping to get more material into the rectum. So getting fecal material into the rectum triggers more peristalsis, which causes more movement of feces into the rectum, which further stimulates the stretch receptors, which causes more 
um, material moving, you know, more peristalsis, so more material moving into the rectum, and so on and so forth. So here's our positive reflex mechanism. Well, all of this is localized. It's happening right there in the large intestine. This is not something that you are consciously aware of. So at the same time, we need to have the long, um, the long reflex. The long reflex means now we're taking that information to the central nervous system. So ultimately, this is going to become part of our conscious awareness. Now, this long um, reflex is part is also described as our parasympathetic defecation reflex. And again, it's still a positive feedback mechanism. So that afferent neuron that was responsible for the short or localized uh, reflex is also simultaneously taking information to the central nervous system. There it's going to be synapsing onto an efferent signal, which is going to um, increase peristalsis and also help to relax the internal anal sphincter. So now we have material you know, continuing to move down and more material moving into that rectum and that internal anal sphincter is relaxed. So that makes that um, open. The external anal sphincter is still contracted. So this is still closed. This is preventing defecation from occurring. We have to remember, have that conscious level um, control over the external anal sphincter. So here we see that we've had conscious awareness of this um, you know, movement of material into the rectum, which is going to signal our conscious control. We're going to have a motor neuron synapsing onto the external anal um, sphincter, allowing for defecation to occur. Now you can consciously override that, right? So you can prevent the external anal sphincter from relaxing, and that's going to put a stop to the signal, allowing fecal material to move back up into the large intestine, um, outside, you know, move it out of the rectum and back up into the sigmoid um, colon and so forth. Okay, that's it for now.